How did Alaska come to be? And what about Yukon? Well, they all started with this thing called the Alaska Boundary Dispute. During the 18th and 19th century, Russian explorers, whalers, and traders settled in Alaska and claimed the area as part of the Russian Empire. They settled at the Alaskan Panhandle, which is very beautiful by the way, because it had a lot of sea otters and fish, which contributed to European fur trade. In addition to that, the British and American explorers came for the same purpose, thus dominating a European presence over the region. In 1825, the Russian and British governments signed the Treaty of St. Petersburg, also known as the Anglo-Russian Convention, which settled the southern coastal border of the Panhandle because they wanted to focus on the coastal area. However, they did not discuss its eastern boundary as the interior region was mountainous and did not seem as a priority. However, the treaty stated that the line of the coast which is to belong to Russia shall be formed by a line parallel to the winding of the coast, which shall never exceed the distance of 10 marine leagues therefrom. And this seems pretty clear, right? Although Alaska belonged to Russia, Russia was scared that Alaska would be easily conquered by British in future wars, so they decided to sell it rather than having potential losses. They offered it to Canada at first, since it was closest to us, but Canada declined. On March 30th, 1867, the United States bought the entire region from Russia. Ottawa shortly followed with a petition to Washington for a survey of the Alaska Panhandle area to determine the exact location of the border, but Washington rejected because it could be a costly investment for such an outlying tract of land. In fall of 1897, gold was discovered at the location and the United States wanted to maintain control of the intervening territory. Canada wanted a direct route from Klondike goldfields to the Pacific fjords. Due to the argument, they tried to develop a joint commission in 1898 to resolve the dispute, but it failed to do so. Instead, they used arbitration to solve the issue, and thus they referred it to an international tribunal. The members were made of Americans, British, and Canadian authoritative figures. To be more specific, the American politicians included Elihu Root, who was the Secretary of War, Henry Cabot Lodge, the Senator from Mass, and George Turner, ex-Senator from Washington. Canadians that were issued were Sir Alan Bristol Aylesworth from Toronto, Sir Louis Amable Jeté, who was the Lieutenant Governor of the Province of Quebec. Finally, the Canadians asked the British for an arbitrator, and so they sent Lord Alverstone, who was the Lord Chief Justice of England. But before we detail into court affairs, just a side note about Lord Alverstone. Was he just as his title says so? Who knows? But one fact that he was not an outstanding judge, but not disliked. In fact, after he died, one of his colleagues said, The reports will be searched in vain for judgments of this that are valuable. Back to the Treaty of St. Petersburg, it was clear that the border should lie 56 kilometers east off of the ocean coast, but it was not clear on how the ocean coast is defined. The Americans thought that the coast should be defined as the point where the mainland touches Pacific water, and the Canadians thought that the coast was at the western boundary of the Channel Islands. Obviously, the vote was 3-2 to two at the time, and Canada was confident in Britain supporting Canada because it was its dominion, and Canada had previously helped Britain with the Boer War. However, Lord Alverstone ended up supporting America's claim. And this may have been his own opinion, but one of the strongest suspicions was that Britain could sense a war in the future and needed America's support, such as steel and sympathies for an arms race with Germany. Canadians were furious protesting and refusing to sign, but none of it affected the process as the question had been bound to arbitration. Thus, after three weeks of heated discussion, the issue was officially resolved on October 20, 1903. This event may have been quickly forgotten in the minds of Americans, but certainly not for Canadians. As the Canadian Encyclopedia put it, the event had started a strong wave of anti-British feeling in Canada. Firstly, Lord Alverstone was an extremely disliked individual in the 20th century, and Canadian citizens began to distinguish their political interests from both Britain and the United States. They had an increasing desire to gain control of their foreign policy, which was, which was evident later in the reciprocity issue and the 1911 election. As Sir Wilfrid Laurier encouraged free trade with the U.S., he was beaten by conservative Robert Borden, who said that, I am absolutely opposed to the reciprocity, and if the West were prepared to make me prime minister tomorrow, if I would support that policy, I would not do it. Many English and French Canadians supported his words, and so he was elected as the next prime minister of Canada. As we all know, Borden made many contributions in the future, such as the issue of conscription, War Measures Act, and others. If the Alaska boundary dispute had not happened, and Canadians did not have a stronger will to be independent, would he have been elected at all? The dispute also indirectly contributed to Canada's decision after World War I. Canada later supported Ottawa's case for increasing dependence from London when Canada said no. But that's another story. Overall, the dispute was a critical step in building Canadian identity, and without its motivation, Canada might look completely different on the map today.